Good morning. My name is Brian Agadino. I'm one of the pastors at the Summit Church, and I've had the privilege of getting to know Chris and Liz and their family over the last couple of years. And today, I have the uttermost honor of guiding us through Lizzie's service this morning. Liz said to me a couple of weeks before she passed, she said, Brian, I, I really want you to, uh, to dress down at the service. I said, Liz, I don't know if I can do that. And she said, can you do pink? And I said, pink. I got pink. So for Liz, this is for her, my double pink outfit. There is no doubt that Liz had a significant impact on our world. And this morning, you're going to have the opportunity to hear about how God used her in so many tremendous ways. As we remember Liz this morning, we're going to hear from Scripture, we'll reflect in song, we'll share stories of her journey and pray together. I want to encourage you with something in this moment. Please enter into the moment of this service. Sometimes we get into moments like these and we feel this tension of holding back or wanting to protect our hearts. And I know Liz would ask, and I will too, that you would enter into this next minute, hour, and little bit of time and allow what is said and what is prayed and what is sung to impact. In the next moments, we will laugh, we will cry, we will grieve, we will remember the journey of Liz. Psalm 145 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear Him. He will also hear their cry. God is present in this place and he wants to speak to every one of us through the life of Liz. We're going to open with a word of prayer and I ask you again to enter into this service with us. Let's cry when people cry. Let's laugh when people laugh. Let's mourn when people mourn. And let's celebrate when people celebrate. Let's pray together. Almighty, awesome God, you created us and you redeemed us and you will resurrect us. Now, Lord, remember our grief. Be our comfort, be our strength. You created Liz and you gave her to us to know and to love in our lives here on this earth. Give us courage this morning, we ask. Give us peace as we miss Liz. Father, you also redeemed Liz. Remind us this morning of your saving power to redeem the broken and the hurting. And Father, also this morning we ask, convince us that not even death is strong enough to separate us from your love and care. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, death is only a doorway. Remind us of the joy we know in the communion of the saints. Father, console us and comfort us in the guaranteed hope of the resurrection of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. I would like to turn your attention to the screens as we watch some pictures and remember part of the journey of Liz. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face 
is before me I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine I can only imagine When that day comes And I find myself Standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I would do Is forever Forever worship you I can only imagine, yeah. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I Okay, here goes nothing. <laughs> Lizzie loved that song, <clears throat> and while we can only imagine, she's right now experiencing the full glory of God and the answers to those questions in that song. As you saw just a sampling of those pictures, as we move through several others here today, there's a bazillion dollar prize if anybody can tell me how different hairstyles <laughs> she has. Because I guarantee I married a, a, a new woman about every three months. So, so on behalf of our daughters, Emily and Allie, their husbands, Jared and Garrett, and grandchildren, Kinley and Cannon, along with extended family, thank you to everyone for coming to honor and remember and celebrate the life of, life of Liz. I'll ask for your indulgence because I'm pretty much going to read this because I just don't want to miss anything. She was only 62, and we tend to, we tend to think she left us way too long, young. But God had other plans for her and for those of us left behind. 
God blessed us with her presence in all of her 62 years, and I firmly believe she's done all that God needed her to do. And in that time, she built a legacy that will live for generations. Lizzie and I always thought there'd be just a little more time. But the truth is, life can change in an instant, and it did for us, and it'll never be the same. One could ask if I'm angry at God for what's happened to my wife and best friend, but the truth is, I'm not angry. I'm sad and I'm grieving. Of course I am. I miss her terribly. But I also trust God knows why bad things happen to good people, and I don't. When these things happen, my feelings fall primarily into two different views. The first is, what good will come from this, as I believe God ultimately makes all things work for his glory. Just as Liz spent her life giving and investing in others, why would I assume this would be any different after she's no longer physically with us? Even after Liz passed, the girls and I have heard multiple comments of how her life story, including unfavoring faith in her last few days, has impacted the lives of the others in ways we did not even expect. The second is, this is, this is something I usually say, we all want to go to heaven, but why do we want to put it off as long as possible? Doesn't make sense, does it? Liz and I knew the cancer was aggressively advancing and would ultimately shortly end her life anyhow. She was blessed to be able to have last conversations with all of her family in the last few days before she passed away. However, she also took advantage of the time remaining to actually look forward to her earthly death and her eternal birthday. Her biggest concern was leaving those she loved so dearly behind for now. But she also knew we all one day would be together for eternity. And I have faith. Lizzie's in the arms of Jesus as we speak and has been completely healed. And that brings me great comfort. She's no longer in constant pain. For those of you who don't know our background that well, hers and mine, here's a little bit on the two of us. Lizzie and I met on a blind date in 1977, set up by mutual friends of ours who wanted to but can't be with us today. We dated for four long years. Before we finally got married in 1981. And part of our marriage legend is we ultimately did get married, but she turned me down the first four times. <laughs> she said she wanted to marry me, she just didn't want to be married at the time. So when she finally asked me, I figured it was it was time. <laughs> She was easy to love, and I would always tell others she was 24 hours of sunshine every day and had a beautiful smile on her face that was forever present. I've looked back through 500 pictures you'll see today, and from the time she was sitting in the high chair picture you saw there, there was a smile on her face. In Genesis, the Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone, and I'll make a helper suitable for him. And he graciously let Liz be my perfect helper for 44 years of our lives together. And it's not nearly enough for either one of us. Many people may not know that earlier in life, Liz was an x-ray tech. And shortly after Emily was born, she changed careers to be a stay-at-home mom and wife. And it suited her perfectly. My career saw us move several times. Columbus, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, San Francisco, St. Louis, Ottawa, Canada, and back to St. Louis for a second time. And moving can be hard, but in reality for us, some of our most treasured relationships are with people in each of these locations and here in this room. Liz was a big part of making these happen. We have 20 friends in Canada that would have been on a caravan down here but can't get across the border, and it's a crazy world we live in today. Looking back on our lives together, I was recently talking with a dear friend and said if there was only one word to describe Liz, it would be relationships. And he then added, done well. Lizzie never met a stranger, always radiated joy, 
to whoever she encountered, and relationships come in a variety of priorities. For Liz, her relationship with her Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came first, followed by family and friends. And many people had invested in Liz over the years in helping her to be able to come to a decision of accepting the gift of grace and salvation from Jesus and to also help her mature that relationship in him. And she too paid it forward in the same way for others. While we may not do life alone, or I'm sorry, we are not made to do life alone, and Liz was intentional about getting out and meeting people, developing those relationships, and then working hard to maintain them, even up to 40 years since we've moved away from some of our friends. She was intentional about being an encourager, a teacher, mentor, sharing of her faith in the gospel, either personally or through her lifestyle choices, being involved in the lives of her children, volunteering at school, church, Meals on Wheels, or a multitude of other ways in which she served. But most importantly, she was intentional about family. Today, a lot of families are spread over geographic distances, and ours is no different, from Ohio to Illinois to Nebraska to Missouri. Lizzie was the glue that held us all together for reunions, holidays together, many times driving for hours, for proms, homecomings, birthdays, graduation, many special events, or just a time to say, you're important to me, and that's why I made the trip. For 40 years, our family has vacationed in Hilton Head, South Carolina, and it was a favorite happy spot for Liz. This is why all of the families chosen to wear a Salty Dog t-shirt, which is a favorite souvenir from Hilton Head in celebrating her love for the island. And we were supposed to be on vacation there that week that Liz passed away. I could even envision on her way to heaven, she made a short detour, uh, <laughs> spending a last little visit there. And one of the last uh, uh, items about her is one of her top spiritual gifts was hospitality. She excelled in this area and our home has always been an open door and a busy one. She loved hosting and making everyone feel welcome and special. Our home was a safe place for anyone at any time and upon multiple occasions, People came to live with us what, what was intended for a short time, and in several cases, it was years. <laughs> but that was okay. She hosted junior high and high school youth groups, church groups, Bible studies, parties for all occasions, and she made all of the holidays special. There's no doubt Lizzie loved her holidays and all the family traditions she created to go with them. We've all heard the Bible scripture reference about there being no greater love than laying down one's life for another. And many times we think this is a sacrificial life uh, event at one point. But actually it also reflects the sacrificial giving of oneself for others over time with thought of receiving nothing in return. Lizzie told many people that each day everyone's given a choice and a chance to make a difference in the lives of others. When those opportunities present themselves, we all have a decision to make, yes or no. And many times we don't get to see the outcome. It's simply a choice of obedience. In 2 John it says, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. This is what brought Liz the most joy. She loved giving of her time, talents, and treasures. She loved family, loved people, loved being able to make a difference, however small and however simple. She just simply loved life. Lizzie fought a tough battle with cancer over the last 18 months, and in particular, the last three. She was in a lot of constant pain for most of that entire time. And I came to understand just how courageous she was, and this is true for any cancer patient. She chose to have procedures done, knowing they were going to hurt, to go to that next chemo appointment, knowing it would make her sick and wipe her out physically, or go to that next radiation appointment, knowing the damage it caused to good tissue in addition to the cancer, and yet she did it anyway, just for the chance to stay with us just a little bit longer. What lifted her spirits during these times was receiving many cards, letters, and emails of encouragement and telling her how a certain act of love and kindness made a difference in the life of that person. 
of how much she was prayed for and loved. Many have been from friends we've not heard from in years. Yet for whatever reason, Liz's friendship or act of kindness made a difference for them in the moment of their time of need. We marveled of the fact most acts of, of encouragement or kindness to us appeared to be just small in nature. Simply done from the heart, but it ultimately meant everything to that person at that moment in time. One tradition is in our family. is to never part without saying how much you love them. Liz, our daughters and I always end conversations, parting, phone calls, whatever, with love you, love you more, love you most. We never know when our last moment may be on this earth, just like Liz's. If the same should happen to me or any one of my family, each of us knows up to that moment how much we're truly loved. So how do we know how much Liz was loved? Simply look around you. You all are here today because of your love for Liz and her family. And I know it too, because I've heard it in so many ways from each of you over the past few weeks who wanted to be here today and couldn't as well. Proverbs 31 contains what is commonly known as the virtuous wife passage. In part, it says a wife of noble character who can find. She's worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She's clothed with strength and dignity, and she can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise. I would say Liz modeled these virtuous characteristics, not just some of the time, but consistently throughout her life. In closing, I can say without hesitation, Lizzie lived a very full and joyful life. Lots of love received and given, many road trips and vacations taken, intentional investment planning in the lives of others and being an encourager, and I could go on and on. When you combine her joyful obedience with intentional acts of service and hospitality, the result is strong relationships that stand the test of time. She truly did make a difference in the lives of many, and that will be her legacy. Intentional acts of love, compassion, and grace with lessons learned by the recipients that will be passed down for generations to come. Liz was truly one of a kind and will be deeply missed by both family and friends. She finished strong, loved life to its fullest, and was surrounded by many who loved her very much during her last few days on this earth. I'm sure when Lizzie entered heaven, God was waiting with open arms and said, well done, good and faithful servant. While living in Canada, we learned their farewell custom was to say bye for now. I will add to that, I love you most, Lizzie. I can't wait to see you again one day soon. Thank you all for being here to honor my Lizzie. I'm Emily. Um, let's see if I can not pass this off to Jared. <laughs> um, I was skimming through a few of my mom's journal entries in hopes of finding a verse that she'd written about that I could share today. I didn't find any verses, but there's an entry that I'd like to share with you. It's from right before she had her heart surgery. 
My devotionals from yesterday and today are so relevant to me right now. God's talking to me through words on a page. I reread them as if God's sitting face to face with me, just the two of us talking. One talked about illness of any kind, how it's limited by God's hands. Every single part of illness has been foreknown and has an eternal purpose. Nothing in our illness escapes him who numbers the hairs on my head. Affliction is not haphazard. Every part of it is measured. The knife of the heavenly surgeon never cuts deeper than necessary. This sentence, he who has established the boundary line of our lives has also determined the boundaries of our tribulations. And another, I refuse the comfort if it stands in the way of your honor. I often pray for relief from trials or pain, but if I trust God, then I do trust that he has a purpose for it. And my purpose is to grow stronger in him and to bring glory to him through it all. No matter what happens in or after surgery, may I remain standing with the one who controls it all. May I know that it is part of his plan and may his will always be done. May I ask, but may I always end with his will, not mine, be done. She wrote that in 2018, having no idea how much it would apply to her future and the way that she walked through her battle with cancer. I can tell you that even in the worst of it, her faith never wavered. She knew that even if her body lost the battle, Jesus had already won the war. I can honestly say that in all my life, I've never seen her more excited than when she talked about going to heaven those last few days of her life. And I think we all just take hope that that's where she is and that we will see her again. All right, you didn't cry like at all, so thanks a lot. (laughs) I'm Garrett. I'm Allie's husband and Liz's son. Oh, gosh, damn it. Um, I'm going to speak because I will cry, believe it or not, less than my wife would. So Um, I'm going to read a passage out of 1 Peter, right? I'm going to say it wrong. 1 Peter 5.10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That verse carries a lot of significance for us and for Liz, um, specifically because for 18 months of her life, since about November of 2019, Liz experienced some type of physical or emotional suffering. There weren't many pauses in between, like her physical pain from radiation didn't heal till it was time to start treatment again. And she walked through that, like Chris said, with grace and dignity and all these things that are of the Lord. Um, Her suffering for a year and a half may seem far from a little while, But when you look at it with an eternal mindset like Liz did, it is a little while. We are all sure to face suffering in this world. It's a broken world, and someday it will be restored and new. There certainly is nothing easy about suffering, but with the assurance of salvation through Jesus, that suffering can be endured with a beautiful promise in mind, one of an eternal salvation with Jesus. Chris, Allie, Emily, our children, and our whole family have more suffering ahead. We know this really well, but we're also sure of this. Throughout these trials, the Lord can these trials that we're experiencing, the Lord actively confirms us, restores us, and strengthens us. Even greater than that promise, we know that one day the Lord will fully restore, confirm, and strengthen us. We hope everyone in this room knows the depths of the promise of salvation, and we know that Liz would want you to know it more than anything. Thank you.
switch mics here for just a moment. If you saw the invitations and the invites to what was happening this morning at the ceremony, you knew that the family had asked and, and Liz had asked that we have a time where there could be some sharing. I'm a little bit shorter. Um, it's so good to be here today to celebrate Liz. Um, everyone here today has at least two things in common. Well, first of all, I'm Melissa, and this is my husband, Barry, and we're from Tennessee. Um, first of all, we have two things in common with Liz today, um, our love for her and our loss of her. Um, in the weeks between her passing and today's celebration, I have journaled many thoughts and observations and feelings about Liz. She was my first friend when we moved to Cleveland. We had our first babies within months of one another, and we bought our first houses across the street from each other. Though moves and job changes would take us in different directions, we maintained our friendship across the miles. She was the best letter writer, always giving the most detailed updates on the girls and Chris and what was happening in their lives. She invited us into, the world, into her world, and we felt like family. I'm so thankful for the investment of time that Liz and Chris have given to friendship. The weekend before she passed away, I asked Liz if there was anything left undone, anything that she was concerned about. Her answer was for the ones that would be left behind when she passed. She spoke of special family members and friends, of, of her girls, her grandchildren, and of Chris, and how she wished that she would have had more time to love and minister to them. Her love for others was the heart of who Liz was. She pursued peace where there was conflict. She made sure to take pictures and to make memories, and she loved a good gathering of people and was ready for a road trip whenever possible. If you gave her a good coffee drink and some M&Ms, she was ready to go. Um, she was not perfect, but she lived yielded a life yielded to Christ. Her life reflected Christ and how she loved others. The Bible says it is better to go to the house of the morning than to the house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. As Liz began to transition to heaven, I observed her giving every person in her presence her undivided attention, being sure that nothing was left unsaid or unasked. She smiled, she laughed, she looked at each person in their eyes, and she did have a few visions that were humorous, but the thing that I will never forget is that Liz was sure of her final destination and she was not afraid. To honor Liz's legacy, may we all be more intentional and present in our relationships. Take more pictures, make more memories, and pursue peace where there is conflict. Choose to live a life yielded to Christ and invest in the hearts of people. Be generous. All of these things that we know to be true about our friend and our sister in Christ. Liz, you will always be so very dear to me, and I will miss you greatly. <clears throat> On uh, Tuesday, May the 11th, Liz sent her last Marco Polo to Melissa, and she was sitting at the island in her kitchen and wanted to make sure that we had the correct update on her second opinion. She was concerned that Chris hadn't given us all the right information. And she was sitting there talking about uh, her struggles with her physical endurance and pain, all the while uh, popping caramel M&Ms. It was just so Liz. It's just so Liz. <clears throat> we met Chris and Liz 39 years ago. And, and theirs is one of those rarefied friendships that regardless of where our lives took us over the years, when we got back together, it's like we had been apart for about an hour. And so grateful because that's the way their friendship is. It's good that we're here to honor her today. Uh, I think one of the best ways to honor someone is to imitate them. The writer to the, uh, the Hebrews in his letter says this, and we desire that each one of you to show the same measure of earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This is true of Liz, and may it be true of all of us as well. I'm sort of old school, mine's written down, boys. <laughs> I appreciate your phones, but um, Liz gave me these. <laughs> and these are so Liz. 
back when um, Pujols and Yachty and Edmonds were family, I found these under my Christmas tree, and she knew me so well. And this shirt was her idea, just um, this last Christmas. We had a tradition, she and I, of taking um, an entire day before Christmas and shopping at antique stores for old ornaments. And she thought we should wear matching shirts, Nana Claus and Mimi Claus. Our friend Kathy joined us for dinner with a Nana Claus. So we were, we were really tripping there here. These shoes, these red um, Converse-like shoes, are my ode to her. She always had the best shoes, and we were gonna wear red shoes on our shopping trip even though hers didn't fit and it was too late to exchange them. I will wear these red Converse-like shoes and will think of my friend every time I look at them. Liz was definitely a friend for fun, but my dear friend and my sister in Christ was more than that. We walked through some really tough times together. At any given time, one of us was hurting for our kids or our own spiritual health. We cried and we hugged and we prayed and we laughed together. We studied the word of God together. We pointed each other back to Christ in times of pain. And we made sure Jesus was given credit when prayers were answered. I wonder if you've ever had a friend like mine. Have you ever heard of the um, at, at Mar Marco Polo? We were Marco Polo fiends. She and Kathy and I, we would, um, we would do it anywhere. We could be in the um, car, go into the store, which, you know, don't tell anybody that, but, um, or on a walk. Um, sometimes I would pick up my phone on my walk and I would show her the sky and the clouds because Liz loved outside, and she loved the sunshine and the clouds. Um, from the kitchen, while unloading the dishwasher, from the bed, and um, from the bathroom. We always knew where we were because of the pictures on the walls behind us. Um, so there was almost nothing held back from our friendship. I've got many Marco Polos on my phone, even from two or three weeks before she went home. I've not been able to watch them yet. There's one where she's laying on a chair, I think, and she's crying, and she's telling me that she doesn't want to die. But after I had that video, I knew where my friend would be spiritually and emotionally at the time came when there was nothing left to do. That time came for my friend, um, and my friend was right where I thought she would be ready to meet Jesus face to face. Days before she went home, we got to talk and hug. When it was time for that last hug, she said to me, I love you. And then in my ears, she whispered, forever. Her forever days started four days later. I will miss my friend until I get to that forever. Until then, I will remember all that I learned from her. I will remember her laugh, her creativity, and her love for Chris and the girls and their husbands and those beautiful grandkids who they called, who called her Nana. But most of all, I'll remember her love and her care for me. It's kind of selfish, I guess, but through her love for me, I was able to see how Jesus loves. She has left that as a legacy for me, and I will intentionally carry it forever. Um, I, I don't know why I'm doing this again, so hope it goes a little better. So Liz was a really, really good gift giver. Um, like the best gift giver. I don't think I don't think there's another one like her. And I remember my first Christmas as kind of part of your family. Um, Chris, thanks for paying for all the gifts. Um, <laughs> I remember my my first Christmas with their family, and Allie's like, "My mom wants to know what you want for Christmas." I'm like, "Well, I don't know. There's I want a lot of stuff. I'm a poor college kid." And so I like 
I gave Allie a list of a bunch of stuff, like expensive basketball shoes, a soccer jersey, a, a, other, I don't know, a lot of stuff. She bought all of it. <laughs> Specifically, she bought the shoes. They were like, I, I have a problem with shoes, and it's good that she supported me in it, because otherwise I would have less money than I have. And, uh, but every Christmas, she would buy me shoes. And I really messed up not wearing ones that she bought me today, but... Um, that was a special thing for her to do for me. And I have, uh, I have a lot of like physical gifts from her that I'll have for a long time, but they'll wear out and get thrown out at some point. The biggest gift that she gave me uh, was her daughter and the rest of her family. So I get to be part of the Wagner, Donnelly, whatever, I know there's more last names than that, family, um, because of Liz. Because when I came around, she gave me the gift of loving me and bringing me close and just treating me like a son. Um, so the ultimate gift giver gave the best gifts. And I'll have some of them till the day that I die. And I'm thankful for that. Well, uh, I was not on the list to, to speak, so I hope this doesn't screw up the 25 minutes. Um, oh, sorry. There we go. My name is Gail, and Liz is my sister. Uh, I'm the big sister. I mean, I was the one that was supposed to go first, but that didn't, wasn't part of God's plan. But anyway, um, Liz came, all of these pictures and all of the things that have been shared are so true of Liz. But there was a part of her, too, that, um, that I knew, Ray knew, and Russ knew. And our family, when Liz was growing up, was a dysfunctional family. She did not come from a, a family that was um, always loving and caring like her family is, was. Um, she and I became Christ followers at pretty much the same time in our lives. So our families changed. And I really think that she would want you all to know too that families can change and be different um, than what your family of origin may have been. Now we loved our parents, there's no doubt about that. And there was love there, but it was not always an easy love. So. I just think she would want you to know that. And also, she wasn't perfect either because when we were about, I was about eight years old. No, no, I was about 12 years old. She was about four. We shared a bedroom and man, she was not easy to share that bedroom with. <laughs> there was the time that she sprinkled talcum powder all over everything in our bedroom. My mom was mad, but I was really mad because she messed up a lot of my good stuff. So anyway. That was Liz. Oh no, I don't know how to fix this. Good, good? I don't know why I'm up here. My name is Chris and I had the pleasure of spending time in the Wagner house when we were in high school. And um, I went to school with Emily and got to know Allie and Mr. Wagner. Um, I insisted on calling him Mr. Wagner, even though he insisted on me calling him Chris. I don't know. Um, I did not plan to talk today, but I sat in the back, and I feel like Liz wants you guys to know how much she did for people like me. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I did not come from a godly family. And honestly, Liz was my introduction to that. And she spent so much time pouring into me that as an adult and a parent now, I can see. Back then, I just thought, 
your guys' house was awesome, and I just wanted to come. And she always had fruity pebbles, gosh darn it. Uh, and I just loved it, and Emily and I ate so many bowls of fruity pebbles. Poor Liz probably got tired of buying them. Um, so I just want to make sure that you guys know that beyond high school and even to this day, your house has such a special place in my heart. And... Um, Liz and I kept in touch a lot, and I would come visit your house even when you guys weren't there, and Liz would pour into me, and we would talk about a lot of things, and we were always in contact, so uh, she has given me such an example as a mom that I didn't have growing up of a home that I want to create, and an example I want my kids' friends to have, and so... Liz, you got me up here, so thank you. Twenty years ago in June, I left everything that I knew uh, to come to a place I'd never been, to intern at Calvary. And Liz and Chris welcomed me into their home and their family with open arms. This was so kind, so loving, so warm, so hospitable, and joyful, and thoughtful. She didn't just buy Lucky Charms or Lucky Pebbles or whatever the thing was. She bought Mountain Dews and all kinds. No matter who you were, she bought things, and she kept uh, individual items for like 50 kids stocked in the house. She found excuses to celebrate. I never knew people actually celebrated St. Patrick's Day until I found my Lucky Charm shirt, my green boxers, and my green socks sitting on my bathroom counter. It turned out Liz celebrated every holiday. There's so many ways I could describe the gift that Liz's life was to me and my family. Two that are especially important to me are Liz's table and Liz is a champion to our children. Liz's table was always extending and never ran out of space. I've never been around a family who invited more guests to a place at the table who didn't have a place. There were no strangers. There were just friends that Liz hadn't met yet. Liz the champion. When you're a parent, there are a few greater gifts. <sighs> than those who love, delight in, and champion your child. I've spoken at this church and on this stage many times, but this is by far the hardest moment for me. Liz was an absolute treasure to our boys and the way she listened to them intently, engaged them thoughtfully, and showed up for them constantly. One of uh, the special moments that Liz and Chris created in the last six months was they came to our house, they gathered our boys for Christmas, they just bring a gift, they took them out to dinner. After dinner, they went shopping at a couple different stores, and then they came back to our house and they played Mario Kart and video games with our boys because they cherished and they loved them so fiercely. Liz was an absolute treasure. I'm so thankful for the impact and the imprint that she has had on my life and on my family's life. I'm definitely not gonna make this through. Um, Liz came into my life when I was really struggling and I was living with my grandparents at the time in a really small condo and uh, Emily was like, you should just move in with my parents and I didn't know them and um, so she's like, we're going to meet up, I'm going to have you meet them Sunday and it was after Thanksgiving. I moved in on Monday. <laughs> And she was like, just come in tomorrow. And I was like, really? And years later, I found out that she didn't really meet tomorrow, but <laughs> here we are. Um, and she and I, like, she was there for me through so many, um, if I'm honest, treatment stays. And um, there's one time when I was really struggling and um, I was upstairs and she decided to come and check on me. And if she wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't be here today. Um, and 
course, we called Emily and then my therapist. And then she sat at the hospital with me for seven hours. And then um, I got out of the hospital and she drove five hours to take me to treatment. And um, I struggled with the eating disorder. And <laughs> on the way, she, stopped, she, she decided we were going to stop at Burger King. <sighs> and she was like, you're going to eat lunch with me? And I was like, OK. Um, <laughs> We ate lunch, and, it was, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and then they got Oki in the nine days that I was gone because of insurance, and I love that dog. Um, and then there was times where, like, she does celebrate every holiday, and their house is always decorated for every holiday. One time I counted at Christmas in their kitchen with my best friend, and they had 109 items in their kitchen for Christmas, <laughs> including paper towels that had Christmas trees on them. Um, and then for Easter one year, she decided she would hide eggs for me in my room. I found eggs until like September. <laughs> and yeah, so Liz and Chris and the whole family has been like a second family to me. And I um, am so grateful for the impact. I would not be here without you guys. And I love you so much. Hi, I am Garrett's mom, Allie's mother-in-law, and I'm gonna make this quick, but I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, one of the gifts she gave me is she taught my son how to smile for a picture. <laughs> he was really bad at it until he came into their family, and then she gave him so much practice that he can now give a natural smile for a picture, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but when, when she loved Garrett, she loved our whole family inviting us to Christmas Eve and just including us. And um, a little more than a year after Garrett and Allie were married, um, my husband passed away. And I'll never forget how in the holidays in that first year, she just told Allie, go be with the Carlsons, go be with the Carlsons. And she was just so generous in that. Um, and she just always thought of others. when when. Um, she bought herself a cup that said Nana on it. She also bought me a cup that said Grandma on it. And that's just one example. But um, she, she's she been just so important in our lives. And um, I learned so much for her from her. And I'll, um, I'll always be thankful for knowing her. Hi, I'm Christy. Oh, loud. Um, I'm one of um, Liz's nieces. And um, as you can see, there's so many of us. And I mean, truly, I could stand up here and talk about Liz for hours and tell how much she has been an encouragement. And um, as Brian said, a champion. Um, she's been that not only for all of her um, her nephews and nieces, but her great nephews and nieces as well. And um, I think one of the only family members who's not here is my daughter, Annie. And um, Annie sent me this this morning. Um, she's killing her <laughs> not to be here. She's um, serving the Lord in Kosovo this summer. And um, she wanted me to read this for you guys. And I mean, hopefully I'll be able to read it. Um, once when um, Aunt Liz was staying with us when I was maybe 11, she stood outside my bedroom listening to me sing when I didn't know she was there. When I finished the song, she burst in and told me, Annie, God gave you a beautiful voice. Don't you ever stop singing. And it encouraged me so much since it came from her. <laughs> I know she'd be so proud that I'm here leading worship in Kosovo. But oh my, do I wish I could come back home to our deck and sit and tell her about, all, about it like I used to with my other missions trips. Anyways, I love you all. And I know Aunt Liz is partying it up there in heaven. <laughs> so thanks. Um, I'm Katie and there's gonna be a couple things that I just wanted to share about my personal experience with Liz. Um, 
One is that almost 18 years ago, I rolled into their house with a massive suitcase. Um, and Chris teased me about it, and Liz was like, I want you to stay forever, you know. And that is how I felt from the moment I met her, that she always wanted me there. I know a lot of you felt that too, but I thought about it a couple months ago when we had the prayer night, and I thought she had this aroma of Christ about her that made you feel welcome, made you feel like you had the best seat at the table, that she saved it for you. And she also had a wonderful gift of knowing people's stories. Um, a couple years ago, my boys and I went around with her to Meals on Wheels, and I, for years, didn't even know that she did that. And we went around, and she took my boys up, but as we were driving to different locations, she knew every single person's story and just rattled it off to me. And then she gave every single person this intimate attention when we would show up at their house and serve them and drop off a meal. And I just thought, that's why it felt like you were sitting with Jesus because it felt like she knew you and she loved you and she welcomed you. And then the last thing I was thinking about the other day was we, the girls and I got to go on a birthday trip with her and we were obnoxious. Well, more me, but I, I was obnoxious about celebrating her that trip and we were having so much fun and every single place we went, we told them it was her birthday. And one of them, and she was there for it. She was really excited about it. Um, she wore all the silly glasses and we did sh like shirts and we dressed up and did all kinds of things. But one of the things I think about was on the plane, on our second flight, we talked to people about getting her into first class. And she was so funny because she had like special bags of chips for Allie and all these things that she brought along, just like people have mentioned, because she thinks about others in that way. And then she didn't want to go to first class because she wanted to be with us. And she kept thinking like, I want to bring you with me. I want to bring you with me. And we were like, no, go. Uh, but I thought about that for some reason in her last days, because I know if she was standing here talking today, she would say, I want you to come with me. I want you to come with me. In her last week of her life, we talked about this. She didn't cry one time. She was so excited about going to heaven. And so if you do know her and you hear about the love of Jesus that she had today, I just encourage you that she wants you to come join her. She's thinking about everybody in this room about spending eternity with her. So if you don't know, please ask somebody. Liz would be sitting here talking your ear off about it because we watched her do that to so many people. But there's people here that would love to share the love of Christ with you, and Liz would be honored to have that impact start today. <clears throat> I don't know why I'm up here either. Um, I was not supposed to be up here today, but I felt the Lord prompt me, and probably Liz saying go. Um, I am Jared's sister, so, um, but I felt like a daughter to Liz a lot of the times. Um, I have a lot of great memories and stories, but the one that has been impacting me sitting in my chair um, has been when my husband and I lost our son a year and a half ago, Liz was sending me so many Marco Polos that I couldn't even keep up with them. Texts with scriptures, songs saying, sweetie, you just listen to this when you're ready. You know, you can hear her voice, just, you just do it when you're ready. And I, she impacted me the most. Her texts and her words and her prayers stood out the most. And she I just felt like she woke up thinking about me. That's how impactful she was. Um, and she spewed into our lives and into our daughter. And um, just, I feel like she really got us through that time. And it has meant so much to us. And we're never going to forget it. Um, and then my husband and I came up a month and a half after our son died. And 
Chris and Liz just, it, it was just like family and it meant so much to us and that's one of my last memories with her and I just wanted to say it out loud because I know she's here that it meant so much and that's just who she was and that's the home that they created and I'm so thankful, so thankful for sharing, for you sharing her with me and to you, her daughters. Thank you for sharing her with us. I love you guys. Hi, I just wanted to say Liz was like joy in the flesh, right? And I'm Neil, by the way. I'm, you may be wondering who's a black dude. I'm Neil, okay? <laughs> just make sure y'all know. Um, we're for Joy FM and Boost, the radio stations, and she was a, her and Chris were volunteers at the station. They were really family, and they were always like in the first two chairs and um, just always on top of it. And Liz always brought so much joy to everybody's life, and um, and she's a giver as well, and uh, she gave the best hugs as well, and I was just so touched by her. She loved my family really well, and she's always invited us into her home, and Chris, Chris and I, we built a bookshelf together. It, was, it was started as an entertainment system, and then we kind of scaled it down, you know, because Chris is like chip gains in the flesh. I'm more of the chocolate chip. You'll get that, get that later. And uh, she was just such a contagious person. Um, loved us well, and one of the last texts she sent to me, um, after I sent her like a, a video during her journey, she said, oh, make me cry. Thank you so much, I miss seeing you. When this surgery is done and post-office tests are done, then I'm, I'm having your sweet family over for dinner. Okay, okay, love you. So, didn't make that dinner, but hopefully she's saving me a seat in heaven right now. Thanks, love you guys. I know there are many, many more stories we could tell, and I hope none of you are mad at me right now for coming and standing up here and ending this moment, but Liz impacted my life, too. I had the opportunity of, of being there mostly and getting to know her at the very end. She said to me, Brian, when you stand up, I want you to preach about Jesus. And I thought to myself, <clears throat> Liz, I'm pretty sure your life will do that. And isn't the last 30 minutes been just an amazing testimony to the goodness of Jesus through and in the life of Liz? I would like to take just a few moments, not long, I promise, and just frame this. Liz asked me to. <laughs> she said, Brian, I want you to proclaim who Jesus is. And so I, I, if I could, I just, I want to frame this moment for us. And, and Liz had such a great impact on all of us. I think what was most impactful to me at the very end of her life was how she was not afraid of death. I've had the very privileged experience of being at the end of people's lives, too many that I can count. And Liz's was very unique, as they all have been. And her lack of fear really impacted me. I remember going home Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night on those last days, and every night with my wife at, at that night when we would pray together and saying to her, seeing the impact of Jesus in Liz's life is very profound, very unique. I would ask you this morning, what are you afraid of? We all have fears. Some of them are daily fears of being late to work, fears of missing something on our calendar. We all have relational fears, letting someone down, not being good enough for someone. And we all have those deep fears, the fear of pain, the fear of loss, the fear of death. 
What would your life look like if you weren't afraid to die? A few thoughts from the book of John this morning. The story of Jesus and Lazarus. Maybe you've heard of it before. It's in John chapter 11. I think it has a lot to say to us this morning as we remember Liz. You see, Jesus' best friend had died. And we learn so much from this encounter. My, my hope is no matter what you fear this morning, that through hearing the stories of Liz and maybe hearing how Jesus encountered the fears of people, that just like Katie said, you will turn to him today. Let me set the stage. Jesus knew that his friend had died and he'd waited a few days and, and finally he comes on the scene And I want to jump into the middle of the encounter here to help us see that Jesus will engage your fears in the most caring and loving way. The way that we heard expressed through Liz, that is because of her experience of Jesus's welcoming of her. So in the middle of the passage, John chapter 11, verses 32 through 35, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Meaning Lazarus. Come and see, Lord Jesus, they replied. And then there is this epic short verse that says, Jesus wept. What it says there is that Jesus was deeply troubled. The literal translation is that Jesus was outraged. He was outraged at the brutality of death. He was outraged at the sting of death. He was outraged at the pain of death. And at that outrage, he then weeps. Possibly over generations and generations who had been impacted by the greatest enemy, the greatest fear that any of us will ever have. We used to have this joke when I was in college about memorizing John chapter eleven thirty five, 35, the shortest verse in the Bible. And you could say, oh, yeah, I memorized scripture this week. John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. But maybe it's a great verse to memorize because it reminds us that Jesus cares so deeply for the suffering. He feels our suffering. And do you know why that's important? For to someone, for someone to have the right to speak into my fears, for someone to even be able to enter into the struggles of my journey, I need to know that they deeply care and that they deeply understand. And this verse, this expression of Jesus, it shows us that he does. That when you are struggling, what is, what is more helpful to you? Is someone's words more helpful to you or is it someone's tears? I would bet, like we saw with Liz, that it is her tears, her entering in, her caring for, her loving, that is impactful. And that's what we see in Jesus here, that in this moment, it's his tears. And because of his tears, we can now know that when he speaks into our fears, we can trust him. Scripture teaches us that God is not afraid of the language of pain and loss. In fact, Psalm 32, verse 17, it says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. So Jesus invites you this morning with your pain, with your fears, to come to him. He understands. He relates to our grief, to our pain. You see, in the sovereignty of God, pain cultivates his will for our lives, it reminds us that there is a curse that sin has brought into this world. And God has not chosen to eliminate that curse yet. And the effects of that curse point us to the need of something bigger 
than ourselves. It stirs in our souls a desire for something better, for redemption, for restoration, for resurrection. The pain points us to God and our need for him. In the world's economy, life precedes death, but in God's economy, death precedes life. The cross always precedes the crown. So my friends, let me invite you to bring your grief and your pain and your fears to Jesus this morning. But there's more than just comfort that he offers you. In verse 20 of chapter 11, it says this, When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus does this epic thing in this moment as he's reflecting on what life is all about and what it means. What he says to her is so unique, even for some of us who have our Christian simplicities that we offer. He utters the most important sentences in this entire resurrection encounter. It helps sometimes to unpack here what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't offer some Christian platitudes about how everything's going to be okay and how he's in a better place and how we have these simple expressions that we like to say because we don't really know what to say. No, 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 no. Jesus comes into this moment and he goes way beyond any of those things. He gives her the most unique response and expression to grief, the grief of having lost a loved one, the grief of loss, the grief of suffering. He looks deep into the soul of Martha, and he says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Every fear, every need, every pain you have can be and will be met in Jesus, in him, in me, he says. What happens in this moment is one of the most important distinctions that we need to make today. What Jesus is saying is not just that there is a resurrection. Yes, it should bring us comfort to say that Liz is in a better place, that she is in the presence of Jesus. But there is something powerful about what Jesus is saying in this very moment, and that is this, that resurrection just doesn't come into eternity. Resurrection can come today. That Jesus in his resurrection from the grave put death to death, and because he put death to death, We don't have to wait for resurrection to eternity. We can experience resurrection right now. The power that Liz had to love the broken, the power that Liz had to care extravagantly for so many in this room, the passion and care that she showed to all of us was not evidenced in her promise and hope that she would go into eternity. It was evidenced by the fact that she was day-to-day experiencing a resurrected Jesus now. The more time I've been in ministry, the longer of lists the funerals becomes, and, and it is no doubt that people believe that there is something after. In fact, in every funeral that I've been to, Whether it's for someone who knew Jesus or not, there's always this expression that there is something afterwards. But the hope of Jesus, my friends, is that we can be resurrected today. Martha was told by Jesus, yes, he will be resurrected, but you too can experience resurrection now. The answer to all of our needs, the answer to all of our fears, it's not something, it's not a place, it's someone. And Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And my friends, the question before us all today is the question that Jesus asked, and that is, 
do you believe this? The power of Liz's story is that before she experienced eternal resurrection, she was experiencing resurrection up to her final and last breath. And as I ponder and prayed with my wife about what was it that gave Liz such power to have joy even in those final moments of her life, I'm convinced that even in those moments she was experiencing resurrection. That the strength to handle the fear of death was because she was experiencing a a resurrected Jesus right then. My friends, the truth for all of us this morning is that you can experience this too, and I would ask you, do you believe this? To not just hope for eternity, but to experience the person of Jesus today. He is the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Let me conclude where I started the service Liz's life should have an impact on you. It should stir something in your heart. Whether you knew her just barely or you knew her for over 40 years or 62 years. Whether you knew Liz well or not, death should impact us. So let us love each other well. Let us comfort each other. Let us grieve together and let us weep together. But most importantly, let us draw near to the resurrection and the life. Let us draw near to Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, so we too can experience the power of having our fears crushed. Let me pray for us. Almighty, awesome God, we, we worship you and we give you thanks for the life of Liz. But more importantly in this moment, Father, we give you thanks for the life of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. And Father, we pray as Liz would invite us to pray, as so many people expressed this morning already, we pray that your spirit this morning would turn all of our hearts towards you. For those of us who have known you for years and years and for those of us who don't yet know you, might we today experience the power of resurrection? Might we experience the power of love? Might we experience the power of grace? Might we experience the power of hope? And might we experience the power of our fears being crushed because of the resurrection that you want to bring into our lives today because of the resurrection of Jesus. And yes, we have that hope that one day we will rise. And might we experience all today that same power and resurrection that Liz was experiencing in her journey and her life until you call us So we pray all these things in the powerful and beautiful and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Caleb's going to conclude our service this morning. Liz had many requests about this service, and one of them that was that Caleb would sing. And as you know, the Carlson family has known Liz for some time, and uh, just one last time I would encourage you Enter into this moment. Let the words of this song wash over your soul. Reflect on the joy that Liz experienced as she walked into the arms of Jesus. But know that that was the most glorious experience because she had had a taste of it here and we too can as well. So enter into this moment. Reflect, pray, respond. Hear the words of this song, and let's let this be our act of worship. There's a peace I've come to know, though my heart and flesh may 
Amen and amen. On behalf of the family, the whole family who's here today, I give you their thanks. Thank you for being here. It means a lot that you are here, that you gave up your morning. This concludes our service, and there are going to be some refreshments in the lobby. I would encourage you to stick around. We're going to give them just a a moment to uh, hit the restrooms, maybe grab a drink of water, and then we're going to 
uh, do a receiving line up front this here. And so if you wouldn't mind, if you have some time, we'd love it if you would stick around and just come and give your condolences to the family. So one more time, I'll dismiss you here in about 10 seconds. Head out to the lobbies. Go ahead and get a drink or a snack or a refreshment. And then in about 10 or 15 minutes, we'll let you know. And you guys can just come right back in here and the, the family will be up here. Thank you again for being here. It was an honor and a joy to celebrate Liz and more importantly, to celebrate Jesus today. You guys have a great rest of the day and a good afternoon. Thanks for being here. You're dismissed.